Okay, yeah, I just got the polls, and I ended up doing three distinct polls. So we'll play the one okay. um, right after the opening slides, and then the other two after Dr. Moore's uh, talk. Hey, Chris. Yes. It says I'm in the right spot, right? Because it still says practice session on mine. Am I in the right place still? Yes. I have, uh, uh, I'm going to start the webinar momentarily. Okay, good. And uh, why don't you, I don't like a little concern. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I haven't started. So why don't you bring up your opening slides? Okay, let me do this. Where is it here? Uh oh, they go over there. And okay. Okay. And um, it's, it's having it's struggling to getting into the presentation mode here. Yeah, I see it's in uh, edit there mode is. right now. Yep. Okay, okay, good. Uh, That's good. Yep, good. And why don't you? Um, Turn on your uh, webcam. Well, I want to let me turn on my webcam here. Uh, she, do you want us to be on camera uh, the entire time, or only? No, when? just just at the beginning, and then uh, then we'll go all go off when you're doing your. Do you, your, do you want us to be on camera? My uh, webcam thing. Let me stop sharing real quick because then we'll, then I'll get this here. Okay. When I share, there. okay. There you yeah. go. Let me share a screen now. Okay. Okay. Good. Now I'm good. Okay. All right. So uh, I'm going to go off cam uh, off mic here, and I'll open it up. And like I say, wait about uh, thirty to forty five seconds before you start talking. Let people log on. Uh, I'm pinned. It look like it looks like on my uh, webcam or something. What is that, Chris? What do you mean? I have a little pin next to my name. I don't know what that means. I don't see. I don't see that. Okay. It just has your name there. It so. looks like a little thumbnail on mine. Oh, well, I won't Okay. okay uh, it, lo it looks fine. I'm logged in as a participant as well. So everything looks good from my end. So great. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. And once I open it up, uh, it'll start recording. Okay. Just let us know when you want us to start. Okay. Okay. Recording in progress. Okay, well, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. So it's, uh, I'll try to cover all the time zones. So good evening, good afternoon, good morning uh, to everyone. Uh, you know, very lucky uh, to have two very distinguished faculty from uh, one in the Ohio area here and then one from Boston. So okay, more in Kyra Evelyn, and you can see them on video. Uh, so thank you. Thank Recording you very in much. Recording Some fantastic talks. Uh, and we're going to have discussions. Uh, these are our um, commercial interests and our disclosures, what's been received, what role, and these have been uh, adjudicated um, and gone through by our uh, AO North America group. So there's no, no specific conflict for this particular uh, discussion. To obtain CMA credit, this is one category, one hour of category one credits. There'll be a link after the session, as you can see at the bottom there, to claim your credits and access your certificates. This is part of an ongoing series um, to, to a certain extent. So there's, as you'll see at the end, there's some more talks to go on as well. Uh, validation statement. Uh, we are at North at AO North America Independent Not-for-Profit Surgically Specialty Society. We do not endorse or promote any use of products. Um, and we will be very cognizant of any off-label uh, use. Equipment used in this course is for demonstration and teaching purposes only, and it's really to enhance our learning experience. Hopefully, our experience will come across as a learning experience. Zoom etiquette, we're always keep your microphones muted and your cameras turned off. There's a question answer box, which we'll be trying to monitor throughout, uh, and we'll review some of these questions, either typing them or with our discussions. Uh, and please do not use the chat box, as that's our internal messaging uh, if we're having a problem. Uh, throughout the uh, the Zoom this evening, uh, this is a this is a long paragraph. It was part of the promotional, but I really want to say this is a deep dive. It's only one discussions after um, some a brief didactic. Learning objectives are identify which patients would benefit from a nerve transfer. Very important to discuss the relevant nerve anatomy, uh, just not your topographical, but your nerve anatomy and 
to discuss microscopic neurotransmitter. I emphasize microscopic because it's something very near and dear to our hearts, the use of the microscope. Uh, um, and we can have a discussion as to when that's necessary over a uh, high loop magnification. Um, hopefully this plays as a, as a primer to our uh, discussion today. Microscopic Let's neurotransmitter. See, I emphasize those microscopic. Those are, those are so really this is you know you can identify more of a proximal nerve injury we'll discuss some of these things but these are devastating it's but this is just a a, a simple video of, of how devastating sure. this can be um this goes back to homer's iliad for those of the bring us back to our junior high school days that Hector, his shiny helm, hit him with a barren stone on the shoulder. At the most opportune point happens to be the brachial plexus and broke the nerve, fell numb to the wrist, and the, bo the, uh, the bow fell from his arm. So graphs are manuscripts. Uh, they can, can be complete combined injuries, right? You can imagine the devastating nature of the bone, soft tissue, and nerve in this particular instance. Uh, so our agenda this evening, this is, I'm, I'm part of the introduction, trying to keep it uh, short. We're going to discuss uh, ulnar nerve, cover some um, of these very specific, in the end, uh, accomplish. Um, these will be some of our upcoming um, uh, courses, but I'm going to go back one slide. And Abby, can we have our, our first polling question? That's going to lead us to uh, Dr. Moore's talk. Could we bring that up? So I'm going to read this. We're going to give you 15, 20 seconds for a traumatic high ulnar nerve injury, traumatic high ulnar nerve above the elbow. What is your preference in performing a nerve transfer? We're going to go right into this. Would you prefer an end-to-end -end or an end-to-side transfer in your surgical practice? Go ahead. I'm going to stop sharing. And Abby, let us know when things are wrapped up. They can, we can show the responses. Maybe five, four, three, two, one. All right, how many did we get here? So, um, charge here. Uh, wow. Two thirds, one third. Wow, that's crazy for the one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, look at the audience. That's good. Okay, go. here we go. That's All right, good. you're up, my dear. All right, let me get it going for us then. So, one second, I'm going to exit and then restart. Really, I'm going to do it really, really this time. Optimizing video clips and sharing. We good? Everybody see? I'm going to assume so. Yeah, Amy, is, Amy is now at The Ohio State University. I had to put that little <laughs> plug in, so there we go. You, you can't miss it with that huge black yeah. yes, well, yes. I'm, I'm setting my timer, and so over the next little less than 10 minutes, um, we're going to chat about nerve transfers. Um, I, because we have this great uh, setup, I wanted to give us a little more insight behind nerve transfers, and then we'll talk about supercharge. Um, so I have no disclosures with regards to any financial um, relative to this today's talk. So why do we care about nerve transfer? So the things we need to know is that time is muscle. So after a nerve is injured, there is a series of events that occur that allow the neuron per motor, which is held in the spinal cord, to regenerate its axons to the target, the target being defined as the muscle. And so what great science has shown that there's changes both at that muscle, which has an expiration date, but as well as at the nerve, whether we get great recovery. I think we always think about the muscle as, oh, the motor end plates die, we can't get there. But Tessa Gordon showed us that that Schwann cell support is also critical to allowing changes. When we think about nerve transfers, um, Tessa Gordon, again, who is my little guru of neuroscience, uh, she showed us in animals that if you take out 70% of the motor neurons, it is not only until then that you get loss of function, meaning that you only needed about 30% of those motor neurons 
to keep good function. This is why we see such great results with nerve transfers is that we're not trying to get a one-to-one -one relationship of what was before to after, but we are getting that nerve sooner to the um, critical muscle, right? And to the nerve quick enough so that all we need is about 30%. And this is, I think, the foundation of why that little dumb nerve that only does rotations, we're limited by a regeneration rate, millimeter a day, inch a month, foot and a half a year. So if we have an injury at the neck, which Harry showed us with that horrible, you know, lack of elbow flexion on his patient, then by the time it reaches the, the hand muscles, that muscle's already undergone irreversible atrophy. And so we can't change regeneration rate. We have tried FK506, maybe speeds it up a little bit. We have working with using electrical stimulation to charge and increase the efficiency, but the rate of what nerve grows is really difficult to change. And so that's where nerve transfers were born. We were getting okay results with grafting, um, but once we got the nerve transfer closer to the target, we were able to preserve that muscle and give us a better um, result. And I think it's because we do donor, which is in green, end to end to the recipient, allowing us to do that closer to the target, effectively decreasing the regeneration time, doesn't change the rate, but it decreases the time. You don't have to have a graft where you, there is a lot of scar. I go up there too, but you don't have to if you're thinking about nerve transfers. So with that framework in our minds that the nerve transfers are a way for us to get closer to the target and ultimately, I should have put in here the effectiveness. Like, why do we why do we jump on board and have a whole webinar on nerve transfers? Is because they work. They work, and there's been many meta analysis to show that. But when we think about the ulnar nerve, we're thinking about okay, how can we with this very complex muscle organization can we improve it? And so I'm going to give you two how I use the supercharged nerve transfer. In this child, seven-year-old fell through a glass door, lacerated her owner nerve up at the axilla. Another more devastating injury is down here at the, at the elbow. Or we have our patients with owner neuropathy who show up to us and they demonstrate, okay, um, this hand is weak and it's only been going for a couple months and you know that that's been ongoing compression for a long time. And so here are two different options we can use nerve transfers. Owner nerve compression, it doesn't matter what you do at the elbow. We have not been able to improve our outcomes with different techniques done at the elbow. So the elbow is not where we're going to get the best results with owner nerve compression. And I understand there's a bunch of NIH funded trials trying to show one over the other, but in my humble opinion of the, of the literature that's out there, you're going to get about the same result, plus or minus some different complications. And so what else can we be doing? When we think about the ulnar nerve topography, this is the anatomy, sensory, motor, sensory. That is fixed along the entire length of the forearm. And so if you know that this sensory motor sensory topography is there, then we can effectively get into the nerve to find those motor fascicles. The anterior interosseous nerve transfer to the owner motor as an end to end was first described in 1990 and showed efficacy that you can take that AIN with about 800 nerve fibers of motor, transfer it end to end to the owner motor branch, which has about 12 to 1500 nerve fibers, right? Because you don't need a one to one. I just showed you, you only need about 30%. And so here we can do this end to end. Our donor, the anterior nerve, I like to take it as far distal as possible because that allows us to wear this branching. So the owner, um, the AIN sits on the radial of the vessels. You don't have to get into the vessels. You follow it through the pronator quadratus to where it's branching, and that's where you cut it. The recipient, I already we went through this, the dorsal cutaneous sensory, the motor, and then sensory. And so when should we consider a supercharge? Because that was really what I was asked to talk about. So we have to start with the definitions. End-to-end, -end, cut donor into recipient, no tension, donor distal recipient, proximal to this day, 10 years in practice, 15 years doing you know, nerve surgery. I always say it before I cut a nerve. Traditional into side takes the recipient to the side of the donor, and this is used for sensory recovery, a protective sensation, works okay, requires that the nerve spontaneously sprout into the distal recipient. 
A supercharged reverse enticide is taking donor. This is the donor nerve with active axons that are connected to the spinal cord, healthy Schwann cells that are alive and breathing. And we know Schwann cells migrate into nerves before axons grow and allows proximal regeneration of the nerve. So now a supercharge has given you more axons with a different set of motor neuron source plus healthy Schwann cells that migrate in to this recipient to address both the motor muscle as well as at the nerve level. Previously with nerve injuries, such as with the cut nerve in the axilla, we only did nerve transfers for the you know, injury degree four and five. But with the supercharge, it allows us to address the compression neuropathies or those that are recovering. What's most important with compression neuropathy is that there are fibrillations on your EMG. That tells us that it's not too late. The fibrillations are a crude marker for that the muscle fiber cells are still alive. So fibrillations positive with the needle plugged in them, the muscle's still alive and we can improve it. And so this original into side, reverse into side was described by Jonathan Isaacs and we took it into the um, we took it into the, put it in a partial injury model, which it also showed augmentation of function. We did retrograde labeling and saw there was a significant increase in number of, even when we cut it, we still got improvement. And so this is why I am such an um, advocate for the supercharge. So here's the patient as little so that you can have attention free co-optation. The co-optation happens about nine once the fascicles pooch up, then you do very super loose um, uh, sutures to allow the nerve to be stuffed inside that epineurium. And so when we're doing this again, it's distal on your AIN, you go into it, you do it. Here she is, the seven-year-old at 14 months, left hand, the right hand. You can see where her scar is. Still has a little bit of weakness through the small finger, but she's not clawing. She's able to hold. And was this just recovery from grafting up at the axilla? Maybe. Um, it's not perfect, but it's certainly not the claw deformity you would otherwise have from an ulnar nerve deficit. And there she is there. So here's another patient of mine where she had a supracondylar fracture. And you can see her one-year um, result, which is you don't even know which hand it was, right? So came to me with nothing on her um, at six months. And so I took her to the operating room, released at her elbow, did the transfer distally and got a great result. Chronic compression, you saw what she looked like beforehand, horrible claw deformity. And there she is on a still shot. So with the case reports finishing up, we show that improvement in 55 patients, improvement in pinch. There's been others outside of the WashU group that have also shown improvement using supercharged nerve transfer. So my final thoughts are supercharge provides a solution for both the muscle and the nerve, addressing what is instrumental to what we want function in our patients. You don't have donor site morbidity. And in my hands, it's more um, improved functional outcomes. Thank you. All right, I'm going to pass it on to Kyle. Well, unless we want to discuss, we want to discuss. Yeah, why don't we have a, a just a uh, we'll, we'll stay on tack here. Just a little uh, quick discussion. I wrote down a couple of things. One of the questions, rather than side. Okay, so we had it on the group that end to end was the most common, and as we go through this, we call it end to side. But reiterate to us is how much is inside through the perineurium or, you know, so I, I think it's a real important thing to, to and you, you had one great slide on it, but I, for those that were partially listening, go ahead. Yeah, sure. So I like to um, dissect the larger your epineurial window, the more fibers that can go that with into side traditional. So I make a large epineurial window and then it's, you can't be done there. Continue to spread until I see the fascicles themselves. And so I said I was spreading through the perineurium and then someone critiqued me and said, that's impossible, blah, blah, blah. So now I do soft tissue within that nerve and you have to spread until you see the, each individual fascicles. It's not one group. Once you see those each individual fascicles, I'm not injuring them, I have space. And then I take the nerve inside and you're right. I do, I let it be here and I do loose sutures. So the epineurium gets the covering around it, but I don't make it too tight at all. Okay. Kyle, do you, do you sew the, 
if this is coming down in, here's your donor, and we're, here's our fascicles, and let's say we're inside here, then do you take the cow, do you take the epineurium and, ta- and then tack it back up to uh, the, uh, d- the donor, or how do you keep them inside? And then, you know, we're just, for those that are doing these things, they're always asking for technical tips. Give us a few. Well, I think what uh, what Dr. Moore highlighted is very important, which is you really don't want the sutures to be too tight. And I just use the epineurium of the donor nerve and secure it to the epineurial window of nerve. And if you've done whatever you're going to do to the fascicles, disrupted the perineurium, whatever you want to call it, you thereby will allow that nerve to be secure. It's an important distinction for the group is it's epineurium to epineurium. So as this thing comes down in, let's say it's inside here, here's the epineurium of your recipient, here's the epineurium of your donor, and they're just kind of, they're enveloped together. Yeah. Okay, that's, that, yeah. And then the things are free inside. Yeah, all um, those branches and inside, ready to go. All right, we'll, 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 uh, we'll head towards the next talk. Dr. Eberlin from uh, Boston, lead us off. Great. I assume you can hear me in slides here. Um, my charge uh, first is to talk about radial nerve palsy and when we should consider nerve transfers. I think this is a great topic. I'm from Boston, as mentioned. Um, let me go through here. So here's a case uh, for our consideration. So this is a patient with a closed mid-shaft humerus fracture with radial nerve deficit. And as many of you know, I'm sure, about 12% of patients with closed humeral fractures will have some degree of a radial nerve palsy but the majority of them, greater than 70%, will recover spontaneously. So most of the time for these types of situations, you don't need to do anything, but there are some situations in which there's quite a bit to do. And the first question to ask ourselves is, can we do better than tendon transfers? So this is a video. This is one of my patients. We've, um, of course, uh, seen this before. Sorry, I'm just trying to mute the sound here. But um, where the patient is quite uh, debilitated by having the inability to extend the wrist to the fingers. And you ask her to do it, she's unable to. This is a high radial nerve injury. And, um, you know, there are many different combinations of tendon transfers that can be considered. My favorite are the pronator teres to EC, the FCR to the EDC, and the pulmonaris longus. Not with the axilla? I prefer Maybe. the FCR um, it's not- to you. And you know, we all know quite well how to do these tendon transfers. But here's my question. This is the same patient, three and a half months post up. And if you look really carefully, she's got quite good wrist extension. um, And she can extend her fingers, but when she attempts to do so, she to do that. And this is a functional hand. When we look and she turns her, when she uh, supinates a bit here, um, you can see she's got good thumb IP flexion and extension. And I think most of us would say that this is a relatively acceptable result for tendon transfers and our topic tonight. So this was a great uh, paper by Dr. McKinnon and group in 2019 in PRS Go, where she basically surveyed peripheral nerve surgeons here that for motor nerve deficits, um, the, uh, the number of surgeons that perform uh, radial nerve uh, nerve transfers to radial nerve palsy, either less, the, uh, the least common nerve to receive a nerve transfer um, uh, in, this, in this particular survey, which I think is pretty interesting. So if we have a 45-year-old male who comes in six months after humerus fracture that was treated non uh radial innervated muscles, should we consider nerve transfers in this patient? Well, as we all know, the functional deficits that are present are wrist extension, finger extension, and thumb extension, and to some degree, um, uh, radial dorsal radial sensation on the hand. So in my opinion, reasons to consider nerve transfers in this particular patient, he's pretty young, 45. It's not that old, but not that young either. Um, the presentation is relatively soon after injury. Um, in my practice, I really want to do these types of nerve transfers by six or nine months at the latest. I think you can stretch it up to one year, but that may be pushing it. And the other reason to consider nerve transfers for this patient is the potential return of independent digital extension. And you saw in the video that I showed for tendon transfers that you can get a good outcome, but all the fingers are extended simultaneously. Transfers for this particular problem is they may be less predictable. So this is a little bit of a recipe. And I guess if you remember nothing else from this talk, it might be worthwhile remembering the nerve transfers that are available. So for wrist extension, there are kind of two common ways to do this, to use the FDS to the ECRB branch. Again, think of synergy with tenodesis or the anterior neurosius nerve to the ECRB branch. And this is the distal AIN when it innervates the pronator quadratus, similar to what we were just talking about with the ulnar nerve. And so the first one is really highlighted by Dr. McKinnon and Bertelli. I think most surgeons would consider the FCR, flexor carpi radialis, the posterior neurosius nerve, 
as the nerve transfer for thumb and finger extension. And then you could consider a nerve transfer for sensation, but that's so-called babysitting tendon transfer at the same time. So it's worthwhile knowing this as your recipe or, or options. So in order to do this, the anatomy is critically important are by making a single proximal volar forearm incision and looking and identifying the nerve. And if we look at the radial nerve on sort of the left side of the screen, I typically will find the radial sensory nerve distally, trace it uh, proximally underneath the brachioradialis until I encounter the ECRB branch, which is generally parallel to it and much smaller, as well as the posterior neurosius nerve, which is larger and dives deeper and obliquely into the dorsal forearm musculature. So this is pretty reliable. You can identify this. And on the uh, more ulnar side of the forearm, the median nerve branches come off the ulnar side of the median nerve. And this allows you to have sufficient length to transfer it to the radial side. Um, if you're doing median to radial by these donor nerves and you can stimulate them and ensure that you're taking the right branches. And it's worthwhile seeing here that the FDS uh, has two nerve branches, typically at least two of them. And you can take the proximal FDS nerve branch to reconstruct um, the, uh, the ECRB for your wrist extensors. So here are some pictures of that. Uh, this, is, this is a case from Bob Safa, but you can see the median nerve branches here coming off the ulnar aspect of the median nerve. Here's the ECRB branch, which you can see parallel to the radial sensory nerve. And the posterior neurosius nerve is a bit radial to that and is larger. So this is how you identify the ECRB tendon, uh, nerve transfer. I would like to show in this picture a different nerve transfer for radial nerve palsy. This is what Dr. Bertelli has highlighted, which is to take the distal anterior osseous nerve um, where it enters the pronator quadratus to sort of flip it up proximally and then to transpose the ease so that you can have your coaptation there. Um, and you can see that in the screen as well as the uh, FCR to the posterior osseous nerve. I hope that is clear. That is the second possible ser series of nerve transfers. You might also consider a sensory nerve transfer, but as I mentioned, this would be LABC to radial sensory, but as mentioned, this is not very common and probably not necessary. So here's a video uh, from Sammy Tufaha from Johns Hopkins, um, one year out uh, of his patient, one year out from uh, nerve transfers, and you can see the tremendous result this patient has. Um, you can see the independent wrist extension, the independent uh, finger and thumb extension may be more reliable. Okay, so I think everyone has seen that here. And, um, but I, in the last few moments, I'd like to highlight what data we have for this, these nerve transfers, because I think that that's very important. So this was really the first paper that had a, a reasonably large series of patients uh, from JHS in 2011. Comes 18 of these 19 patients had good or excellent return of wrist extension, also had concomitant tendon transfers from the pronator terrace to the ECRB at the same time. So it's a little hard to know how much was a nerve transfer, how, was it, how much was a tendon transfer in those nine patients. Now, importantly, and I think this is part of the discussion here, is that only 12 of 19 had good or excellent finger and thumb extension. So that means that seven patients did not have a great result for their fingers and thumb with nerve transfers. And this is obviously from an, uh, an expert in peripheral nerve surgery. This paper came out in Journal of Hand Surgery in 2020. And this is from Dr. Bertelli comparing nerve and tendon transfers for radial nerve palsy. This is a great idea. Um, and he did this in his own patient. I'm just going to summarize it by saying, highlighting the results on the screen here. But he essentially found that for his patients, the nerve transfer results were superior to the tendon transfer results um, for radial nerve palsy. So pretty interesting, a pretty head-to-head -head comparison. And the cutoff in terms of timing for Dr. Bertelli was less than 12 months got nerve transfers and greater than 12 months got tendon transfers. I want to finish by highlighting this, this technique paper in JHS, which is a high recommend if you're ever to do this nerve transfer and you've never done it before, uh, by Dr. Davidge and Dr. McKinnon. And there are seven pearls that are highlighted here about the uh, nerve trans, about the median to radial nerve transfers. First, the transfers must be synergistic. And she highlights the fact that this is why she chooses the FDS branch, the ECRB, because it's synergistic with tenodesis. That makes sense to me. Pearl number two, no tension on your nerve repair. We all know that quite well. That was highlighted by Dr. Moore. Uh, and ensuring that there's no um, that there's no encumbrance of the nerves uh, so that they have full ability to function. She highlights the use of tourniquet use commensurate with experience because after about 30, 40, 50 minutes, 
you do lose the ability to stimulate the, the muscles using a nerve stimulator. In my experience, you really have to kind of race to get the donor nerves all set up with your vessel loops prior to doing the nerve transfers. Pearl number five, results take time. Pearl number six, aspect of a motor nerve transfer to ensure that the patients are going to optimize their outcome. I think that um, having a great therapist with whom you work is very critical. And then her pearl number seven, which is you got to decide in your operation, whether you're going to do tendon transfers or nerve transfers and kind of, but I think both of these tools should be in your toolbox. So to summarize with radial nerve palsy in my practice, I consider nerve transfers for relatively younger patients, really that kind of have to be less than 50, early presentation after the injury. And I mentioned that in my practice, I want to do these by about six months. I may stretch nerve transfers for, for this particular indication out to nine months, but usually not longer than that. If there's no option or no plan for proximal nerve repair or reconstruction. And then I think importantly, patients, the differences between nerve and tendon transfers, because I think as a surgeon, we are obligated to offer both of these options to our patients and to really choose the most appropriate option for a given patient. So thank you. Uh, my final slide. Um, I would conclude by saying that I think that tendon transfers are relatively analogous to the S&P 500. They're tried and true. They work pretty well. Over time, it's very likely to go up, except for today. Um, but nerve transfers are more analogous to the crypto market, which you may, you may hit a home run every now and then, but you also may strike out, uh, especially if you're buying the Luna coin that uh, disappeared a few days ago. So uh, I'll stop there. I appreciate everyone's time. We'll have some discussion. Dr. Aberlin, th thank you very much. And that's, uh, uh, as you could see on a lot of these, uh, and, and so, you know, as we, I think we had two polling questions, Abby, now would be a good time to do those. And I have one or two questions as we, as we continue uh, for our group and we'll do it in 15 seconds in the last, uh, have, have you been able to evaluate or care for a patient with a radial nerve palsy last one year or the last two years? I changed my internet connection. So Chris, I hopefully it's a little bit better now. I'm quick on these things because um, it's a long time. Uh, so five, four, three, two, one. It's like when you're at the gym. Okay. Next, next uh, set. Okay. So this is, yeah, this is fantastic. I mean, look at this. Uh, so we had 43 people answer and, you know, so out of the group. So it's a, it's really good and it's really appropriate. So the next question, if we could. Now that you've heard the uh, the talk from Dr. Eberlin, I think I have to, I have to close it. Yep. Okay. Is there, there was one more polling question, Abby. Can we do the, the other one too? So now that you've heard this talk, right? So here you go, right? Um, it's a bit loaded, but in a high traumatic radial nerve injury and whatever is done to the radial nerve, whether it be, you know, uh, repaired, acute, things are stabilized. Um, what's your preferred reconstructive method? Tendon transfers or nerve transfers? It, it, it's, I don't want a biased answer. I want an honest answer. So, um, five, four, three, two, one. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's all right. Uh -huh. so let's try S and P, you know? Um, so it's, I, I really enjoy sometimes the polling and we try to keep it quick. Um, I, I have one question for our group. Um, you've done the nerve transfer and it just doesn't work well. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I guess I haven't had this situation uh, to a certain extent, but what, what, what would you do? Um, we, we do have some availability. And let's say realistic, right? You know, the, the, they don't get great finger extension and they really they will do, you will do, Dr. Moore will do your and then uh, Kyle. Dr. Yeah, Dr. Moore. Sure. Yeah, I, I'm fine with the first name. Um, I'm yeah. happy to have that conversation. Um, so, as for the radial nerve transfers, I, I think, you know, Kyle, you, you, you knocked it out of the park in the sense of it really depends on what your patient is, um, if they have the time for the nerve transfer recovery for the rehab, do they have nine months or do they need to get back to work to provide for their family? And so that is my determinant, whether I do the nerve transfer or the tendon transfer, thankfully, you know, and I have done probably 12 to 15 nerve transfers for radial nerve palsy and 50 or more, you know, tendon transfers. So I even have a small number of doing nerve transfers and I haven't had the failure. Thank goodness, because I do the McKinnon way. And so um, what would we do? I think then you have to work about, okay, you take all of your FCR for your PIN. And so then it becomes other strategies to stabilize the wrist and take FCU um, or an FD, 
you know, if I did SDL, I would have done FCU. So I really think I'd have to stabilize the wrist and take FCU. Yeah, okay. I, think, I think the important point to mention here is that if you have taken the FCR as a nerve transfer, the motor nerve as a nerve transfer, you're not going to be able to use it as a tendon transfer for a bailout. Um, so you have to think of that going into it. And, you know, as Amy mentioned, I always got to, you got to look for the home run. You got to find a young patient early out uh, from injury that's likely to have a very good outcome from nerve transfer in order to embark on that road because tendon transfers do work well. So I think that's probably where we are, I think, in 2022. Okay. I, I, have, uh, I have had one patient where I have used the FCU um, after the FCR didn't work. Uh, and I was very concerned about wrist flexion, but it seemed that all the flexors um, can pull through. Yeah, they pulled through. They sort of, yeah. the brain sort of figured it out a little bit um, uh, yeah. for finger extension. And just one last comment is if you have reasonable wrist extension, a tendon transfer for finger extension works really well because they can sort of modulate it, right? It's okay. in those patients that that um, don't have good wrist extension that they have to do that sort of TND cyst drop to a certain extent. So, okay, to stay, to stay a little bit on time, let's go to our next, um, our next. Great. Well, I'm up again. Um, and I'm going to be talking about sensory nerve transfers, which I think is an interesting topic that is highly underutilized. So hopefully um, this will be of interest to you. So for the next eight to nine minutes, I'll talk a little bit about goals and indications for sensory nerve transfers. And then I'm going to really go through some practical tips, I think, for how you can employ this in your practice and go through some scenarios for you. So unlike motor nerve transfers, sensory nerve transfers do not appear to be time sensitive. You don't have to race to get that nerve transfer to the motor end plates, and they seem to be able to be performed at any time. And you could wait theoretically for your proximal nerve graft or reconstruction to see if you've restored appropriate sensation prior to considering a, a sensory nerve transfer. I think that's a very important point. And the goal here is to restore critical sensation in the hand. So as I mentioned earlier, these are uncommon but are likely underutilized. So what is critical hand sensation? Well, if we look at this diagram here, I think most, if you have a median nerve uh, defect and it's not recovering and you want to restore sensation to the median, uh, median nerve innervated aspect of the hand, which is the radial, uh, the radial side of the hand, of course, there are two donor nerves that you could consider, the ulnar nerve as well as the radial nerve. And there are different strategies for these two. Before I tell you about these, I would really like to highlight this paper, which I think is outstanding. This is Amy's paper in PRS uh, from 2014, which really lists a lot of the critical uh, nerve transfers in the forearm and nerve. You can transfer the ulnar nerve to the median nerve either at the level of the wrist or within the hand itself. Okay, I'm going to show you examples of that. So if you're going to go at the level of the wrist, you can take, and here's a diagrammatic uh, picture of it from Amy's paper, you can take the dorsal ulnar sensory nerve and go into the radial aspect of the median nerve so that you restore critical, uh, critical sensation. You don't want to go into the motor component, so you need to do an interneural neurolysis to determine that. Um, but that's uh, an ulnar to median nerve transfer at the level of the wrist. If you're going to do it at the level of the hand, you can take the distal ulnar innervated uh, to the radial small finger and the ulnar ring finger. Um, you can see here identifying the fourth web space nerve branches and the more critical radial sided nerve branches. And you can um, do your donor's distal recipient proximal and transpose those nerves through the palm into the radial side to do your ulnar to median nerve transfers more distally in the hand. So just to summarize, you can use in the hand here. And this is a little bit zoomed in, but you can get plenty of length on these. Okay. If you want to use the radial nerve to restore uh, MHS, um, this is a great diagram, which I think will highlight and explain this well. So essentially what we're taking are the dorsal radial innervated nerve branches to the thumb and the index finger screen. And we're essentially doing an end-to-end -end nerve transfer between those radial nerve innervated branches and the volar median nerve innervated branches. So you're getting closer to the target. And he described this in eight, uh, had some restoration of, of protective sensation. And so this is another technique to have in your mind. So again, that's for missing median nerve sensation. If you are missing your ulnar nerve sensation and you need to restore critical sensation to the ulnar border of the hand, 
Um, you may find this for patients with very high ulnar nerve injuries where your nerve grafting or reconstruction did not confer any sensory benefit. And what you can do, and I'm going to show you a case of mine in a second, is to take the third web space fascicle of the median nerve and transfer that into the ulnar sensory nerve. So here's a case of mine. This is a patient um, in his late 20s who had a, a, an ulnar nerve injury, unfortunately, during Tommy John surgery. He's had a number of operations for ulnar nerve repair, ulnar nerve grafting. He's had tendon transfers in his hand, and he is at least four or five years out from his initial injury. But he is a chef, and he continues to burn the ulnar side of his small finger and his hypothenar eminence because he has no feeling there. And he had seen a number of different hand surgeons. I, uh, I think I was the first person to mention to him that this could be considered serve transfer. So here's how you do it. So you first need to obviously explore the palm to identify uh, the nerve branches, including the third web space of the median nerve, as well as the ulnar sensory nerve. And I try to go as proximal as possible on the ulnar sensory nerve, just to make sure I capture as much of the hypothenar eminence as possible. Um, you have to dissect that third web space branch of uh, common branch of the median nerve quite proximally, so you have sufficient length. And here is the nerve transfer. Uh, you can see there's no tension here. I did do, um, I'm going to point out to the screen here, an end to side nerve transfer between the distal aspect of the third web space uh, common digital nerve to the remaining median nerve. And this patient actually has gone on to do quite well. His two-point discrimination is about 10 millimeters or so. He's got protective sensation, and uh, he's not you know, sustaining burns and other injuries. So I went to MVC. He lost his thumb. Um, he had initially a bypass, a radial to ulnar bypass to perfuse his hand. And the only flexor tendons, here's a picture here, the only flexor tendons and motor innervation he had intact for extrinsic flexion was the FTP to the middle ring of small fingers. So here he's got large median uh, and ulnar nerve gaps, a large soft tissue defect, a missing thumb. And um, I ended up doing an index finger amputation to cover the, the palm here. Um, I grafted uh, the ulnar nerve proximally for pain, but really his radial sensor nerve was quite distal. And of course, there's no thumb or index finger anymore. So this is imminently usable to reconstruct sensation on the ulnar side of the hand because it's more distal. So here's our radial sensory nerve as a donor nerve. And uh, I used the pedicle abdominal flap to cover this, which of course is not terribly difficult. Um, and overall, this patient went on to do reasonably well. Um, and uh, he did not want any further surgery, but actually did um, gain protective sensation in his ulnar uh, the ulnar side of his hand. So I'd like to summarize by saying that sensory nerve transfers are pretty on border sensation, usually involves sacrifice of adjacent and less critical uh, sensation. But there are a few studies investigating outcomes for sensory nerve transfers. So this is great to have in your toolbox, but we don't have great outcome studies kind of looking at um, uh, large series of these types of patients. So I hope this was interesting and I appreciate everyone's time. Thank you very much. Nice job, Kyle. Yes, yes, fantastic. I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll uh, we have a little time at the end, but I want to go to our last um, presentation and then we'll, we'll do a little more uh, question and answer wrap up. Um, so great. This, uh, last presentation of the evening and we're, we're right on schedule yeah no it'll be great because this is too exciting um but i think you know just to make one comment towards the sensory nerve transfers i think the problem with why we don't have as many um studies on it is because it's really hard to account for it like it the outcomes of sims weinstein's i guess is the best sensory recovery and we don't take the time in our busy clinics to test it so it is like so well how did that sensory recovery go i'm like Ugh. We didn't really check it. So anyway, but that's that's here or there. That was great and very um, provoking of what we can do for sensory. Um, we're going to finish off on the median nerve. So we've, we've taken this little round the world for high nerve injuries. Um, and for the median nerve, these are some of my favorite nerve transfers. Uh, and I think it's because you can get pretty great results with very little, if any, donor site morbidity. Um, and so let's get to it. So, you know, median nerve injury, I don't think for this group that I have to, you know, describe what the problem is, but they come in all different, you know, flavors of injury. And so, you know, the AIN, um, anterior nerve deficit, you know, this came from a gunshot wound, but I see probably most coming from a Parsoner's Turner or a viral neuritis or any type of neuritis that knocks out the AIN. Totally a different topic of why is that nerve really susceptible, but it is. And those are older individuals where, yeah, there was a question about age, and I have no age limit for any transfer. If I'm within the window um, of six to nine months, I will do a nerve transfer, but expect it to grow slower, therefore giving that expectation. So here we are with the AIN. 
Our no transfer options, there's been multiple um, publications about what we can do and um, let's go for it. So if one that I think is most successful using is ECRB, which is my favorite. So the donor, we saw this anatomy for the median to ray donor transfers, but you can, the same anatomy sits, you know, you find one curvilinear incision in the form, you find your radial sensory, your radial sensory lies underneath your brachioradialis. You follow your rate brachioradialis and your radial sensory proximal. The first branch is your ECRB. The ECRB is not within the PIN and underneath supinator. It is separate. So it can get very close to the target, which is your anterior interosseous nerve. And there were also questions about whether you can go into side or reverse into side for sensory. Here's a perfect example of where I've used it. He had recovering high injury up at the um, axilla in an adult. So I did the end to end to give him the AIN function and did an end to side sensory because sensory takes, we have a longer window for recovery. Here is another patient, older individual that Parsonage Turner AIN neuritis. Again, AIN is right there in the same hall. You have to reverse this now. So now distal is to the right. So I apologize for that reversal. But here in the muscle belly, here's your radial sensory. And the next one over is your UCRB. And beside it there is the PIN. And the AIN is the only radial branch. And you can follow it into the muscle if you're concerned. And so here's what that nerve transfer, no tension whatsoever. I go above the vessels. There's plenty of distance you can get distally into the muscle and proximally after the, after the median nerve. And what outcomes we can expect when you're post-op for this gentleman, he came back because he had a bull in his chest and like that, did not come back because of any therapy, but has great use of that function. I cut the AIN, I transferred, and this is his result. If I hold, stabilize his thumb, he has great function. Here's an older gentleman. I think this guy's 76. Um, I forgot to take pre-op video. So this is in his first post-op. Still has his fresh um, you know, sutures. But then here he is at a year. And this you know, is an incredible result um, for somebody. Again, I cut the AIN. So there's no his own natural recovery. Maybe he would have. Maybe he didn't. But for sure his heck didn't affect his wrist extension. And he has a great result. Opposition, you know, comes down to if your patient has pro prolonged carpal tunnel, this is not the patient who gets the nerve transfer. So you have to understand timing with nerve transfers. We didn't really touch too much about it, but timing means, you know, within six months and chronic compression from carpal tunnel, you have no idea how long that's been going and the status of that muscle. So this is not a patient population that I would do nerve transfers for. Um, however, there it is on options when you have this crazy traumatic, this guy came to me because of pain, not for a nerve transfer, but the reason they never cut out his neuroma and they did a radial sensory to the side distally to give him more sensation was because on um, exam, he demonstrated, and sorry that the is there, so he demonstrated function of his thenar branch. And so everyone was afraid to cut it out. So this guy had horrible pain. So there's his thenar branch that's working. And so he, I decided I would do the Bertelli transfer using his hypothenar to his um, uh, thenar. And here he is at six months able to cross over and oppose. So I cut out the horrible neuroma. I grafted it for pain and sensation and then did the nerve transfer distally and got a great result. So now is my new favorite one. So I've done it multiple times since. It just takes one in the same kind of scenario. So thoughts with media nerve transfers, you can use them AIN, you know, you can do a side to side tuna D tendon transfer to get the full grip um, for opposition, a really good motor transfer. Um, is using that hypothenar branch. Um, and, and honestly, we just need to get more you know, studies out about this outcome. So thank you very much. There's my great family who could do anything without them. All right, let's talk. Okay, we have uh, we have five minutes. I have, I'll put up here, this, this, this is, look at all the stuff I took here. So, um, we were nervous we weren't going to be able to fill up the time. Right, here. So, uh, these, are, these are all great things. Um, and we'll, I'll do a share screen here real quick. One of the questions I have for the folks is you mentioned um, the... Uh, in chronic carpal tunnel compression, not doing a nerve transfer. How about in chronic cubital tunnel or ulnar nerve, doing a um, supercharge or a nerve transfer? Yeah, great, great question. So the difference is the length, right? So um, with, this, with the chronic compression and they have fibrillations in their first DI and adductor, then I'm doing a supercharge nerve transfer. Um, always. Release at the elbow, transfer do whatever you want at the elbow, and then I supercharge for ulnar. For median, that little hypothenar is less than a centimeter. So you have to neuralize proximally on your thenar branch to get it to the recipient. So there's no supercharging the thenar. Yeah. Would, Unless would, someone else comes would, up with some great yeah, idea. Yeah. Would you consider a, uh, uh, I guess I've, I've never done one in, in chronic uh, carpal tunnel uh, versus uh, compression, but it, but, it, but it brings apart the point was is that if there's something still there, right? Supercharge is possible. 
Um, Kyle, what do you think on those on those things? Like how much how much you need is there? Or yeah, I mean, I, my indications are very similar to what Amy mentioned, but I, I think for carpal tunnel, I, I agree that it's not that Bertelli transfer that she just described is not really going to be particularly useful there because you have to go more proximal, and it's actually quite a bit of dissection to do that. So I, I, I'm not certain that that's the sweet spot for uh, a supercharged nerve transfer. Yeah, very good. Um, the uh, the timing between doing uh, motor nerve transfers and sensory nerve transfers. Okay, we, we, we touched on that a little bit, but uh, uh, Kyle, why don't you tackle that one real quick? Yeah, I mean, it's obviously a big question, but um, it depends on the type of nerve transfer. So for the ulnar nerve, um, I think I, my, I will extend my time frame for an ulnar nerve, uh, AIN to ulnar motor, a little bit longer because I don't think the tendon transfer options are as good. For radial nerve, I want to do it sooner if I can, because the further out I get, I'm more likely to do tendon transfers because I know I can get a pretty good outcome with that. So that's that's sort of my gestalt for the motor nerve transfers. And for the sensory nerve transfers, we, I don't think, uh, and I don't, we don't believe that there's a real time window for that, although that may not be true, but I think you could do it at any period of time. It's debatable for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think there is a window. I mean, I've tried to do nerve grafting for neuromas, you know, 10 years out thinking like it's going to be great and still get no recovery. Um, I think even a couple years out, I've gotten no recovery for grafting. And so I do think sensory has a window, but I don't think we have any idea. <laughs> um, so I totally agree with you, Kyle. I, I try, I think within a year, two years, I, I have a hard time. Yep. I've done, I've done a couple of sensory nerve transfers later and in three or four years and um, it's protective, but it's not necessarily discriminatory, if that's a good descriptive word. Um, I have, I put up the excitement page because uh, you know, I, I, I get it. a great slide, Gary. Let's share, you can do a screenshot. It's, it, it's excitement, right? And so this is fantastic stuff. Um, we have just a couple of quick minutes. Um, I have one question. Is, um, is distal decompression, it's a loaded one, obviously. Mm -hmm. Is distal decompression of the nerve necessary when you've done a more proximal nerve transfer? Yes. Okay. Yes. You get your yes, Dr. Kyle? Whole wholeheartedly yes as well. I'm a very aggressive about distal decompression for any nerve injury or nerve transfer proximally. Yeah. Why I, not? I'm, Why not? A little bit on the fence because uh, I'm concerned, even though you decompress it, there is some scar there at the decompression. So I, I, I'm on the fence sometimes and it depends what I'm, what I'm doing it for. I've done some of the distal decompression. They haven't gotten bogged down, let's say, at the risk. Um, yeah. But I think for the beginning part to eliminate those variables, it's probably a yes. Well, sometimes I'll wait, you know, till, you know, the nerve gets there before I do the decompression. So it doesn't necessarily do it at the same time, but I'm going to give you the, the, the mindset that I have. After a nerve is injured, it swells. It just swells. As a nerve recovery, it's swollen, right? There's a lot of studies that show that swelling, that increased diameter. And, and someone needs to do the study with ultrasound in humans, fine. But you have a fixed space through which that nerve passes. And so when we think about the pathology of pathophys and carpal tunnel syndrome, right, where you get numbness and tingling, weakness is a late finding, right? There's a pathophys that same is going to happen to your nerve that you're wanting to recover. And so why would you think that it wouldn't be any different? And so sometimes I'll wait and I do something crazy thing up here. I know that nerve is not going to get there and get stuck early. So I can do that later. Um, so, but I will be doing it. I have no doubt that it helps. Okay, great. We're, we're just about wrapped up. Someone had a question in the question and answer. What are your absolute indications for nerve transfer? And I'll just, you know, maybe say it's high uh, in injuries where you're not going to get distal recovery, right? You know, it's beyond that window of, let's say, the motor 18 months. Uh, you know, nothing's absolute in, that, in this world, but that's about as close um, as you get. Or nerve avulsions, right, where it's just uh, of some sort, it just is not going to uh, to recover. Um, you know, I found a couple of very interesting points. 30% of the nerve necessary for some sort of function. We talked about time to injury important. Um, I hope you understand that you can use this in compression and trauma. And I will reemphasize know the anatomy and practice. Whether you practice uh, by watching the video or, or thinking about it in your netter or you have an opportunity for a cadaver lab, um, uh, I, I, I continue to practice. I'm you know, it's getting a little thin and a little bit right up there, but I, I continue to practice. Um, uh, so uh, upcoming uh, live courses uh, in June and October, you know, uh, these things are always um, uh, fantastic. And if, if you have the, uh, the uh, means, they're, they're, they're great. Uh, we have a couple of online events. The uh, Complications and Upper Limb Series goes through June. And then separate, there are some uh, AO North American hand webinars such as this one. I hope you enjoyed it. August, DRJ and stability, bone defects of the upper limb, uh, male unions and non-unions. So um, we'll, we'll wrap up for about two minutes. Uh, we started at two minutes and I would really like to thank um, Kyle, Amy, Chris, Abby, the rest of our uh, staff. And you know these things, um, you, you see the product, but there's a, a lot of preparation behind the scenes. Um, people put a lot of effort and time into this to make it run. I gotta tell you, today was seamless. So, um, uh, team, this was, I just had a, a great, a great time. Um, so we'll, we'll sign up. I think, Abby, did you have a, a couple of little quick things at the, at the end there? Um, yeah, here it is. Um, uh, evaluations, please rate the overall agreement with the following statement. Registration process was straightforward. That's the beginning part. And uh, please rate your uh, 
agreement with the statement interactive features of the webinar were straightforward. Did we, did we, did we pull it off re reasonably? <laughs> we're not going to ask you to learn anything, but uh, uh, hopefully, hopefully what we presented was, uh, was, uh, was good. 